in this uh, unforgettable season, uh, there's been a lot of things that have encouraged me. And one of the foremost is getting to watch the, the global church, at least as much of the global church that, that I can read about or study, get, getting to watch the, the global church respond. Uh, at the onset of all this, I was sharing my heart that, that this is our hour, the church is our. And we've all been able to watch the church step into that and accept that challenge and remain unified and adapt. And I believe the gospel has gotten out on more new forums in this last eight, nine weeks than we've ever seen in history. As I share with you on Easter, I believe it was the most watched Easter in all of our history. It has been our hour and I've been encouraged to see us take advantage of the opportunity. Uh, that said, I, I come to you tonight with, with a certain level of heaviness. With as beautiful as the previous nine weeks or so have been, I, I also recognize that, that the church right now is going to be under great attack. In, in fact, if I could be really specific, I would say it this way. I think we're getting ready to see a battle being confronted by an enemy that is desperate for our disunity like any of us have ever fought before. I think we're gonna find ourselves on a new battleground. I think we're gonna see new schemes and strategies from the enemy that is desperate desperate to see this beautiful thing that has transpired and risen up in the church. He longs to see it dismantled. And so I come to you tonight with, I hope and pray, a, a timely teaching that I'm begging God would breathe on so that we could walk out of this time more engaged and aware of the battle and more equipped to fight. So all that said, I, I wanna ask you a question. I, I want you to go with like the, the first things that are coming to your mind as you consider what do you think about the church? If someone came up to you randomly and just said, hey, what, what, do, you, what do you think about the church? Like right away, right away, your mind goes to a building, to a people, to a time, to a season, to an experience. Maybe some of you would respond in these ways. Well, the, the, church, uh, the church hurt me. And certainly many of us, uh, if not all of us at some point, could articulate that statement. Some of you would say, well, the, the church has been been really good for my kids. Like I love being able to surround them with encouragement. I love to be able to take them to a place where they're hearing truth to combat some of the things that they're experiencing in culture. Uh, some of you would say that the church helps my love of Jesus. I, I hope that's true. I hope that it's true about this place and your experience here that it's aided in your pursuit of the Lord. Unfortunately, some of you might say that the church doesn't accept me. For anyone who has that experience, I am deeply sorry. Again, I, I can't speak for every single situation that all of us have encountered. I can just say about our place that I'm a part of shepherding, that if you've ever experienced that here, I'm deeply sorry. Our desire is to love people precisely where they're at while showing them the power of God's love over their life. And so if you've ever felt um, a stone thrown at you 
or that you, you weren't welcomed into this place, please forgive us. Now, some of you would rightly say that the church is filled with hypocrites. And I understand that statement. I understand that perspective. While so others of you would say that the church is where I experience freedom. I get around the body of Christ. I, I walk the path of this life and I get nourished in my pursuit of freedom in Christ. That list is nowhere near exhaustive. Again, I wish we had the time to put a microphone in all of your homes or wherever it is that you're listening and just ask you the question. But I'd like to, I'd like to point our attention to a little something different. Let's say it this way. What if the scripture drove our perspective of the church and not our experience? What if, what if when we were asked the question, what do you think about the church? What we instantly thought of, what instantaneously came to mind was how, how God's word talked about the body of Christ. How the scripture paints a portrait for the beauty of the church globally, holistically, eternally. What, what, what if it was his word and not our experience? The result, my friends, would be a movement. I get so passionate thinking about how the church was launched in the book of Acts and how Jesus ascends and leaves behind the apostles, tells them to wait. In their waiting, power comes from on high through the gift of the Holy Spirit. And all of a sudden, these used to be B-teamers all of a sudden, these former fishermen and tax collectors, now with the power of the Holy Spirit, are connected to the head of the church. They're connected to Christ. As Christ now resides in them, and the movement of the gospel, the movement of what Acts calls the way, begins. And we get this perspective of the movement of the gospel being unstoppable. And, and I believe it can, it can be ours again. I believe what we see in Acts, I believe what we see in the movement of the initiation of God's church can be ours again. The issue though is that our movement forward is drastically hindered by our experiences in the past. God is consistently saying, let's keep going. More need to hear about the beauty of the good news. More need to see the unity of broken people now with the Holy Spirit inside of them, more people need to see my bride. But, but our, I'll just speak for myself, my movement forward at times is so hindered by what's happened to me in the past in the confines of the body of Christ. So here's what I'm gonna do, my friends. I care for you so much and I, I feel as though uh, this teaching tonight is so essential for our growth. I just want to pray right now for a saturation of God's word. That some of our past healing, or some of our past hurt rather, could find healing right now, even as I pray. So let's pray, and then we are, we are going to launch in seeking again the movement of the beauty of the church. God, please. 
any of the wounds that any of us hold from our past journey with the body of Christ, I pray God for a healing to be done right now. Heal our confusion. God, heal the perspective of our identity as we've been at times degraded. Heal some of the horrific things that we've heard, even the heinous things that we've done. I pray God right now for healing. And in light of that, Lord, I pray that in the healing that we can see your church through the lens of scripture, that we could embrace again how you described and made the body of your son Jesus to be. So please do that work in us now. Please, God, in your great name, amen. Now you're asking, Mark, what does this have to do with 2 Timothy? I'm so glad you asked. Let me remind you. Last week we studied in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22, Paul telling Timothy, so flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. And, and I wanna share more profoundly now why this is so, so on my mind. I've often thought of Paul as kind of this, this rogue gladiator dude that didn't need anybody. He didn't need relationships. He didn't need people. He, he had, you know, like somehow blood running through his veins that was, um, that was not human, and, and so in that perspective, which isn't biblically accurate, but in that perspective, then you would think that his encouragement to Timothy, other disciples, other church planters would be, listen, you don't need nobody. It's just, it's just you and Jesus. You don't need to find yourself in community. In fact, push community away. They'll just be a distraction. And instead, the, the most beautiful teachings on the body of Christ, apart from Jesus himself, comes straight from Paul's writings. He, he has this perspective of the bride that would say, no, there, there's, there's something else that's happening. God has given us relationships. He's put us in a community, which is exactly why, my friend, that I believe right now more than ever, that is going to be under attack. The enemy has, has seen us adapt. The enemy is witnessing the message of the gospel getting out in so many new ways. And so I believe he's coming at us. We could say it this way. The enemy is thirsty for disunity in the church. Thirsty. It means he's going to be aggressive it means he's going to look for something to devour. It means his murderous attempts is now, I believe, going to be seen in his thwarting our unity in Christ. But I'm so thankful that I, I get to look at all of you now and share in this victory that the Holy Spirit is actively unifying the church, just as active and aggressive and thirsty as the enemy is for disunity. I'm so thankful tonight that the Holy Spirit is actively unifying us, actively bringing us together, actively saying the movement is alive. And so what we're gonna do tonight is we're gonna, we're gonna take that moment in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22, where Paul reminds Timothy to continue along with those who call on the Lord, to continue in community, to celebrate relationships. We're gonna launch off of that, use that as our foundation to now journey through the desperation that we have for unity in Christ. And we're gonna do it through a famous, familiar text in Acts 2. Um, unfortunately, just about every time I've ever studied Acts 2, 42 to 47, I've, I've been tempted to only romanticize 
its ability to somehow translate into our experience. I was like, man, maybe, maybe if we could, maybe if we could get there, it's, it's felt like something that's far away that we had to grasp for. But again, tonight, what if the scripture shaped our perspective of the body and not our experience? And so because of that, I wanna go slowly through the initiation, the origination of the church. They've just gotten the Holy Spirit and these are now the first fruits of the body of Christ whose leader has been executed and is now ascended and what he's left behind is a commissioning. So we see in verse 42 of Acts 2, Dr. Luke writes, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. I love this. Again, everything we're gonna see in this text, it's, it's like the, the church in its purest and still broken form. What, what I mean is, it's not yet perfected. Jesus hasn't returned. Anyone who's come to Christ to this point, who has the Holy Spirit, is, is still walking in the tension of the person I used to be and the person I am now in Jesus. But at the same time, there's this, there's this purity to it as it's the first fruits, the initial glimpse of the Holy Spirit working in believers. And so I, I, love, I love what we see in their unity. We're gonna look at six statements from each of these verses. And if we're gonna look at the church through the lens of scripture and not our experience, we could say this, that there is a unified devotion. They were together in what their eyes were looking towards. They were unified in where their time was being invested. Uh, church, listen. I believe in this time, drawing from what we see in Acts 2, what we've witnessed in the church of the ages, we must embrace a unified devotion to King Jesus. We must release some of the investments that we've made being devoted to other things that have ultimately become distractions in our full-hearted devotion to Christ. And we must together, all of us, every person who claims that he is king, it's time for a unified devotion to Christ. After that unified devotion, we see this in verse 43. I love this. And awe came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. We, we see this pattern in Acts. As the, as the gospel's moving forward to some of the places where it hasn't been, God was using signs and wonders to show his power. But, but I'm drawn in verse 43 to awe came upon every soul. Come on. But picture us, friends, so enamored, so in awe, so unified in that sort of reverence that when we're in each other's presence, when we're communicating through text, Listen, even when we're on a Zoom call, there's just this shared reverence, this shared awe. You can see it on people's face. When you get around people that have been meeting with the Lord, they radiate the light of Christ. I, I'm imagining, I'm imagining, as we begin to come back together publicly, I'm imagining as we continue certain aspects of virtual gatherings, I'm imagining a shared and unified awe 
that will completely change our vantage point of what God is doing actively in lives. Listen, it is so contagious when you get around someone and their, their whole entire countenance is changed because they've met with the Lord. We are desperate for this right now, my friends. A unified awe that says, only you, God. A unified reverence that says, we're only gonna bend the knee to you. We're tired of bending the knee to anything else. Just you, God. If you're looking for this, if you want this kind of unified reverence, then the action is we must meet with God then. Seeking him in prayer, submitting to his word, longing for him in worship. The church had a unified reverence. Now Acts 2 uh, verse 44 is interesting. I've seen it taught many different ways and it, it kind of can feel a little bit communistic. But instead, I, I, wanna, I wanna show you just how articulate Luke is here of what's happening in Acts 2. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. I, I'm not believing for one second that what Luke is saying is, and this person liked basket weaving, and so they all liked basket weaving, which is probably somehow chronologically and archeo uh, archeologically accurate. I'm not saying that. I I'm not saying that every single person had the same gifts because then it would go against Romans 12 and other texts. What I am saying about the church is they, they had unified desires. Their desires were shared. Their, their pursuits were common. The desire was, okay, um, Christ has ascended. He's left us with a calling. He's given us the Holy Spirit. And so our desire then is to walk in that power and glorify his name. It was almost as if we could say that they were so one track minded that then Luke would write that they had everything in common. Have you ever gotten around a group of people in error or in accuracy towards the scripture that are just one track minded? Just you, Lord, or just whatever it is that they put in that place. For us to experience unity in this time and combat the assault of the enemy that certainly is coming after us, it would be as a church to say, whatever it is that you want for us, Lord, we will embrace. Whatever direction you desire, that's where we're headed. And not just a few of us, collectively, God. We lay our fears before you. We trust that your perfect love is gonna cast out all fear and we're gonna walk in faith as we follow you. They had unified desire, so much so that look at Acts 2, 45. They were selling their possessions, come on now, and, and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. They're not, listen, they're not just talking about it. This is the biggest thing that's on my heart tonight. I just don't want to talk about unity. Like it's the message we're supposed to say. Right, right? It's the thing we're supposed to communicate. If I, if I was up here right now saying, hey, listen, guys, we, we really need to strive for disunity. I mean, that, that would go against everything that we understand to be true. But it's one thing to say it and it's another thing to act on it. It's one thing to say, oh, we desire unity, but then, then have, have no activity from that place of truth. They had a unified mission. We're gonna show the love of Christ. We're going to sacrifice. And not just a few of us, all of us are gonna sacrifice. He, he hasn't told just a few of us to deny ourselves. Listen, my friends, please, please listen. 
He's called all of us to deny ourselves. I've been hurt and burned in my experience. Either feeling alone in the denial of myself or as someone struggling with self-righteousness, escalating myself. But, but in, the, in the times where I have seen a unified mission, like when a group goes to Ecuador, I'll even speak of this past trip, the mission so clear, the unity so strong, the relationships so, so bound together in love. There's just a, there's a sweeping joy that comes with that. So imagine that times La families and imagine that times the body of Christ. Yes, globally, but let's just speak Let's just speak for Matthias for a second, this small local expression. There is a sweeping joy, my friends, when we get locked in together on what it is that our life is doing. Oh God, please call us, all of us, to sacrifice, to focus on loving others, to embrace the mission that you've given us to make disciples. Send us, send us, oh God. And then you have... Verse 46, one of my favorites of all of this exchange. And day by day, attending the temple, what's the word there? Come on, together, and breaking bread in their what now? In their homes. This is in large part where we get our model of gathering together in homes on Sundays they received their food, <laughs> and, and generally I received my food with glad and, and generous hearts, but, but they received it in the context of community with glad and generous hearts. The day by day focus of verse 46 allows us to make this observation as they had a unified commitment day by day. We know that we have to pursue this daily. We know this is not a momentary exchange. We know this is more than coming together on Wednesday nights, virtually or in person or being in a lot family. We, we know it's more than that. It's, it's a day by day journey, a day by day pursuit. They had unified commitment. Now, the reason why we get get off on this specific piece, the reason why we get off track, get off course on unified commitment is, is there's different understandings of what our purpose is. And so when you, when you bring person A and person B and family C and this perspective, when you bring it all together and you ask them, okay, what is your primary commitment? And this person says, well, my primary commitment is the, the accruing of wealth. And this person says, well, my, my primary commitment is going to be, be seen in uh, my, my desire to have a solid career and my, my overall commitment is gonna be to my children. And I mean, when you have very commitments, that's why it's very, very difficult for us to feel unified on the field of battle, right? Come on, I, I, don't you ever feel like there, there's times where you show up to the war and you're looking around and you're like, where's, where's everybody at? Oh, well, I, I had, I had prior commitments and I had, you know, I had this going on and, and, and listen, I'm not saying that, that we're not to have careers or that we're not to love our children. That's not at all what I'm saying. What I am showing you though, from the scripture, not from our experience is that the first fruits of the body of Christ was this we are in this and we're in this together. There's no going rogue. There's no pushing away. There's no saying, I got this. No, we're, we're in this together. And for that to be more than words, I believe what happens in Acts 2, verse 47 
praising God and having favor with all the people in these gatherings. Look at what happens. And the Lord and the Lord added to their number day by day, those who were being saved. Movement. They're coming together. They have all these things unified and God is breathing on it all. Look at this, day by day, they're seeing salvation. Church, I long for this so desperately because I know for many of you, if I were just to ask you, when was the last time you tangibly saw someone get saved? You'd be like, well, I mean, I, you know, I saw kind of the, the fruits of it. I heard someone's testimony. Or I, you know, I was with someone six months ago. And man, I'm, I'm, still, I'm still riding on, on that really incredible excitement from six months ago. Imagine if we were seeing salvation every day. Listen, can you even conceive of that? There, there would be so much exuberant joy in God's breathing over a unified church, so much so that the darkness would be overrun by the light and lives in droves turning to the power of Christ. Can you just, can you just picture it for a second? This church, because of what God was doing, had a unified praise. God, we recognize that this is not us, this is you. Your work, your power, your love. Seriously, it had to be so transformative walking in the unity of these six things. Not based on your experience, just look at this from the lens of the scripture. Unified in mission commitment, praise, devotion, reverence, and desires unified together through the Holy Spirit. And so I'd like to ask you, would you want to, would you want to be a part of this kind of church? Is, it, is this the kind of thing you would sign up for? Well, I, I know that some of you would say, well, I, I don't know, Mark, so I'd, I'd like to help you assess. Unfortunately, um, we've unified over some other things. Hindered because of our past, fearful, about how to walk in the future, the church in America, not holistically, but certainly in pockets, has a unified judgment. There's a unified preference in song choice, or volume, or expression, or language, a unified immaturity, a, a unified slander in the way that we talk about other people and defame some of the rest of God's creation. Unified politics, come on now somebody. Or unified compromise. Uh, some of you would say, well, I, I, don't, I don't know if I, I don't know if I wanna be the church that's built on these things. Well, if, if your answer is no, If you look at this list and you say, I'm, I'm not interested, I just wanna make sure what you're saying, you're saying then you're not interested in Jesus. And it's time for people to communicate that truth. If you are disinterested in a church that's unified in mission and commitment and desire and devotion and reverence and praise, then my friends, what you're saying is you're not interested in Jesus because that's who is the head of this body. He is the leader of this movement. And so if you're not, if you're more interested in judgment and 
immaturity, slander, preferences, politics, and compromise, I just want to make sure you understand something, that then you're signing up for a cultural gathering or a conglomeration of a different group of people that just say, look, we, we're, we're just going to rally in some sort of social context around, a, you know, some sort of a, a cultural I, I, idealism. We're just going to pursue something that gives us better hope about life after death. We're not really going to submit to Jesus at all. We're just going to submit to our ideas. No. The unified church is a movement and it's ours now. So then I want to ask as we close all of this is, is how can we pursue righteousness? Like Paul told Timothy, to pursue through unity as the body of Christ. How, how do we actually pursue all of this then? How do we put this into action and into practice? And so I wanna show you three texts, make three final statements that I hope together we'll embrace as the enemy is coming after us, my friends, with a great assault. Colossians 3 verse 15 says this, and let the peace of Christ, what's the word, come on, Rule in your hearts. I love this. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful. How can we practice righteousness? How can we flee any kind of experiential driven church? How can we embrace the biblical body of Christ? We Pursue peace. Listen, who do, you need, who do you need to talk to? Who, who, is, who has wronged you that you need to go to and say, listen, I haven't talked to you about this and I'm sorry, I've been fearful, I've even been cowardly, but I wanna let you know this, this hurt me. Who, who do you need to pursue so that that you can build again as far as it depends on you, peace and unity. If we want peace, my friends, we have to pursue it. It's not something that's just gonna come by sitting on a chair and hoping for the best. We have to be pursuers of peace, peace ruling our hearts. And so I encourage you right now in this, in this time more than ever, some of us are gonna be gathering on site. Others of us won't be able to do that. And there's, there's going to be a temptation for us to divide. There's gonna be so much temptation for us to start speaking out even against one another in the body because we, we feel disjointed. No, instead of the disjointedness that can come, we can pursue peace, letting it rule our hearts. Embracing how God has connected us into one body. One of my favorite texts to show point number two comes from Hebrews 10, verse 24 and 25. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So there's so much, I mean, this, Hebrews 10 verse 24 and 25 could be like 16 sermons altogether. Let's just, let's just take one simple truth from this beautiful text and say this, pursue encouragement. Your law family leaders are gonna need so much encouragement, so much encouragement. Your discipling relationships, your brothers and sisters in Christ, your leaders, the elder team here, what if we pursued encouragement? I know some of you would say, but Mark, I'm just not a natural encourager. But when you want to love others, when you desire to be unified in commitment and devotion, then what comes with it is this Holy Spirit move in you that says, who can I encourage? Who, who can I ask? how they're doing in all of this that I might breathe some life and love through the Holy Spirit into them. Pursue encouragement. It would be amazing. I, I, I picture 
arise of not just encouraging words or encouraging pursuits or how we pray for one another, but just a rise of a love and deep rooted care in expression like we have never seen. If that happened, my friends, we would be spitting in the face and stomping on the head of a serpent that's trying to grab our heel. The last thing he wants is us to self-sacrificially love one another because it's what shows the love of Christ. Finally, Ephesians 3. How can we embrace this and put this into practice? Ephesians 3. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in who? Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever, amen. All of this that we've talked about tonight will be null and void unless we pursue Christ. All of this has to be driven from our time with the Lord, hearing from Him and encountering Him and experiencing the fullness of His presence as we pursue Christ together, my friends, we are going to radiate Christ to one another. And so out of my, my care for us, my desire for our unity and my longing for God's glory. I'm praying that you can assess whether or not this is the kind of church that you desire to be a part of, not Matthias's lot, but what God describes as his church. And if we can embrace it again, if we can see the unity that we've, we've watched rise in the previous eight or nine weeks, I'm telling you, my friends, we will again be a part of an unstoppable movement. So I want to encourage you, wherever you're at, to assess what it is that you want to be a part of. And if it is the body of Christ, then take some time tonight to seek God for healing over experiences past and ask him for wisdom in how to walk in step with the spirit as you pursue righteousness now. And so I'm gonna pray for movement right now in your heart, in our hearts, and in our community. Let's ask for it, come on. Yes, God. Yes, Lord. God, move in our hearts. Stir us to repentance for the ways that we've attempted even to pull down or slow down or drive by our preferences your body. Forgive us for the ways that our sin has hindered others. We pray, God, for movement and healing in our hearts. We pray, God, for movement in pursuit of others. God, I, pr I pray that you'll pick us up and move us forward as individuals. And then, God, I plead that over our body. Oh, Lord, unify us, please, Lord. Unify us in devotion and commitment. Oh, God, put a unified praise and reverence on our heart. I pray, Lord, that the coming weeks that we will see 
a rise of unity and that it will mean, God, your glory in our body. And we ask for that in our community, that our city would reap the benefits of more and more local expressions that are stomping on the head of the serpent in the power of Christ. Unify us like never before, God. In your great name.